Well, we begin this hour with breaking news. Uh, Mark Meadows, criminal co- defendant Mark Meadows, co-defendant of Donald Trump in Georgia, has just filed an, a, an appeal with the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals asking for a f- hearing by the full Court of Appeals. His first uh, appeal in that case was heard by a three-judge panel who rejected Mark Meadows' attempt to move his case to federal court. He's currently being prosecuted in Georgia, uh, in Fulton County, Georgia. He wanted that case removed to federal court. A three-judge panel uh, unanimously ruled against him. He is now uh, asking to appeal to the full 11th Circuit. That would be 12 judges who would then hear that case. Uh, That could then lead to him appealing to the United States Supreme Court uh, on this. That is breaking just within the last few minutes. Uh, Mark Meadows asking for uh, a hearing of his appeal uh, by the full 11th Circuit, uh, all 12 judges after being rejected by a three-judge panel. Three-judge panel is the normal way uh, federal appeals are handled. It is uh, unusual to try to reach beyond them, although it does happen. Twenty twenty four is, of course, a presidential election year, but it is also the year of Defendant Trump, Defendant Trump 2024. And the first big action of 2024 for Defendant Trump is next Tuesday, when the Federal Court of Appeals in Washington, D.C., a three-judge panel, will hear oral arguments in the case of United States of America versus Donald J. Trump, in which Donald Trump is charged with federal crimes leading up to and on January 6th. The first defense Donald Trump has offered to those crimes is that he is immune from criminal prosecution because he was president of the United States. If that argument holds, then all four current criminal prosecutions of Donald Trump will collapse. The appeals court has set an expedited schedule for Donald Trump's appeal of trial judge Tanya Chutkin's ruling that there is no form of immunity that protects a president from criminal prosecution after he has left office. Today, the appeals court issued a notice to Donald Trump's lawyers and Special Prosecutor Jack Smith that the lawyers for each side should be prepared for questions next week in oral argument by the judges about amicus briefs filed in the case by third parties, including one that says... Donald Trump has no right to appeal Judge Chutkin's denial of immunity until after the trial. So it is possible that Donald Trump's appeal of this absolute immunity claim could be short-circuited by the appeals court if they agree with that amicus brief, which they find important enough to have warned the lawyers that they are going to discuss it in oral argument next Tuesday. Here is the immunity claim that Donald Trump's lawyers have made in their written brief to the appeals court. No president, current or former, may be criminally prosecuted for his official acts unless he is first impeached and convicted by the Senate. That claim defies the history of impeachment as it has been used against federal judges, for example, who have been criminally prosecuted before being impeached. Donald Trump's lawyers seem to know that they will probably lose that claim of immunity with the appeals court. And so they have added another layer to their claim of immunity from criminal prosecution for Donald Trump. Quote, nor may a president face criminal prosecution based on conduct for which he was acquitted by the U.S. Senate. And that claim, of course, applies only to Donald Trump, who is the only president ever to face criminal prosecution after being acquitted on similar charges in an impeachment trial in the Senate. Of course, Trump lawyers are not quoting the Constitution when they make that claim. They are simply inventing a principle that they hope a Trump-friendly Supreme Court can accept 
Special Prosecutor Jack Smith's 82-page brief to the appeals court describes what is at stake this way. The defendant's sweeping immunity claim threatens to license presidents to commit crimes to remain in office. The founders did not intend and would never have countenanced such a result. Jack Smith says that if the appeals court accepts the Trump argument, then that would give immunity to, quote, a president who accepts a bribe in exchange for directing a lucrative government contract to the payer, a president who instructs the FBI director to plant incriminating evidence on a political enemy, a president who orders the National Guard to murder his most prominent critics, or a president who sells nuclear secrets to a foreign adversary, because in each of these scenarios, the president could assert that he was simply executing the laws or communicating with the Department of Justice or discharging his powers as commander in chief or engaging in foreign diplomacy. Under the defendant's framework, the nation would have no recourse to deter a president from inciting his supporters during a State of the Union address to kill opposing lawmakers, thereby hamstringing any impeachment proceeding to ensure that he remains in office unlawfully. As usual in federal courts, the oral arguments of this appeal will not be televised next Tuesday, but an audio feed will be available, which I hope will be carried live on this network. Joining us now is Professor Lawrence Tribe, who has taught constitutional law at Harvard Law School for five decades. His new Boston Globe op-ed is titled, In Defense of Maine Secretary of State, Shanna Bellow's Courageous Decision to Keep Trump Off the Ballot. Professor Tribe, I read your Globe op-ed piece. I, I want to go to the new information we have tonight uh, in, in Donald Trump's legal filing in Maine. Uh, point one is he did not engage in insurrection, uh, those words are in quotation marks, engage and insurrection, leaning heavily on whatever the legal definition of engage and insurrection turns out to be in this case. Well, that's exactly what we would expect him to say, but there's nothing new about that. Shana Bellows held a hearing in which she considered all of the legal materials relevant and all of the factual evidence, including the evidence developed at the January 6 uh, congressional hearings in which Donald Trump was invited to appear, he was given ample opportunity to present his side of the narrative um, in this administrative hearing. He didn't succeed. Um, his claim that he was denied fair process is based on nothing in the law. He's absolutely confusing an administrative hearing of the kind that Shana Bellows properly held under the law of the state of Maine with a criminal trial or with a civil trial in which damages might be assessed or the property or liberty of the of defendant might be at stake. Here, what is at stake is whether Donald Trump disqualified himself. Unlike many other possible disqualifications, like age or birth in the United States, where there's nothing an individual can do to remove the disqualification, it's just there because of a fact that's beyond that person's control. Here, it's entirely within the control of an officer of the United States who takes an oath to support the Constitution not to engage in insurrection against it. If he chooses to engage in insurrection, there's nothing undemocratic or unfair about saying he's disqualified himself. The 34-page opinion by Secretary Bellows is very precise. She invokes the right statutes under the law of Maine, and there's nothing in what the president's new lawyer just filed that in any way gives the 
courts of Maine a basis to overturn what she did. But she was right in suspending the effect of her decision pending an appeal to the Superior Court of Maine, recognizing that she doesn't have unilateral authority to make this decision. Uh, Donald Trump's uh, new Maine lawyer is uh, leaning on the statutes uh, in Maine, saying that those statutes only give the secretary of state authority to do things like uh, make sure he has enough signatures to be on the ballot, requires thousands of signatures, make sure his address is correct, uh, kind of clerical things like that in his application to be on the ballot. And then uh, the Trump lawyer says the secretary had no statutory authority to consider the challenges raised under Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. We're basically trying to treat the disqualification clause of Section 3, which is really central to the preservation of democracy from those who would overturn it, as a kind of second-class status, not nearly as basic as residency or, or birth. It isn't. It's equally important. It's perhaps the most important qualification. And there's nothing in the law, either state or federal, that draws a distinction between bases of disqualification that are rather simple to apply, like age, and those that are more complicated to apply, like whether you're an insurrectionist. There's no principled basis for treating them differently unless we say that Hard questions are not to be put by the Constitution of the United States uh, to public officials. When it all comes down to, all of these arguments, both here and in Colorado, are not really arguments about Section 3 of the 14th Amendment and why conservatives and liberals alike have concluded that it applies here. They're basically arguments against the Constitution. There are arguments that say the Constitution of the United States made a big mistake in telling officials of the United States, especially a president, that if they take an oath to support the Constitution and then turn against it and engage in treachery against the Constitution, insurrection against it, then they can't run again that that provision just shouldn't have been there because it's not a good idea. If somebody is popular enough to potentially win, then they really ought to be able to run even if they're disqualified. But there's no basis for that. It's like saying, it's like somebody saying, I don't like the Second Amendment. The Second Amendment means a lot of people die who shouldn't die, so I'm gonna disregard it. You can't just take part of the Constitution and say, you don't want to take it seriously. Either the Constitution is the law of the land, and it's the only fundamental law we've got, or it isn't. And in a year like this, when the future of democracy around the world and the future of the rule of law is basically up for grabs, to take that position, and certainly Donald Trump takes it when he says, He's absolutely immune from prosecution for anything that he does as president, like even if he took a bribe uh, in order to veto a bill, because that's his job, he can't be prosecuted. That is a formula for ripping our democracy apart. That's what's at stake in this new year, 2024, and we have to recognize that that is the issue before us in this appeal in Maine and in the appeal he's filing from Colorado and in the claim of being above the law that he is making when he claims immunity. In fact, in those immunity cases, he makes the remarkable argument that he's more like a king than, than, he, is, um, than he is an officer of the United States. Some of his defenders say he's not an officer under the United States. He is the government of the United States. L'état et moi, I am the state. Mm -hmm. That is not the way a government works that most of us would feel safe living in.
On December 22nd, Pennsylvania's junior senator, Democrat John Fetterman, tweeted to New Jersey's senior Democratic senator, Robert Menendez, resign as the perfect Christmas present for the people of New Jersey and the United States Senate. Senator Fetterman, who was the first of what became 31 Democratic senators who called for Robert Menendez to resign the Senate after he was indicted on federal charges in September, which was followed by a superseding indictment in October. Senator Menendez has not resigned, and tonight he is now facing a new superseding indictment made public late today, accusing the senator and his wife of participating in a bribery scheme involving the government of Qatar, in addition to similar charges he already faces involving the government of Egypt. Today's superseding indictment says... While the Qatari investment company was considering the potential investment into the real estate development owned by co-defendant Fred Davies, Robert Menendez made multiple public statements supporting the government of Qatar. Menendez provided Davies with these statements so that Davies could share them with the Qatari investor and a Qatari government official associated with the Qatari investment company. According to the new superseding indictment in the weeks after issuing the statements in support of Qatar, quote, Davies sent Menendez via an encrypted messaging application photographs of a computer monitor depicting luxury wristwatches with prices ranging from $9,990 to $23,990 and asked Menendez, how about one of these? Harry Lippman is back with us. Uh, Harry, this superseding indictment, uh, it's one of those things that just makes the indictment twice as bad. Yeah, it really stinks to high heaven. So it's the same, it's a bribe where a New Jersey businessman needs money. And the way uh, Menendez comes into it is his financing collapses. So there's a fund uh, by the government of Qatar. And Menendez basically sweet talks them, says nice things to them in public in return for all this payola from uh, that businessman and a little bit of extra from Qatar as well, tickets and the like. So um, it's not a new charge. It augments the old one, but it would affect his total time in jail and just proving it at trial, it will make him look really bad because it's such an abuse of power as chair of the Foreign Relations Committee, a post he is now um, uh, resigned from. And the uh, the senator's second wife uh, is deeply involved in every count yeah. of this indictment and including after one meeting uh, that after that meeting with uh, the senator's wife and Davies, that's when Senator Menendez, quote, according to the indictment, performed a Google search for one kilo gold price, uh, since that was apparently a part of what he was going to be handed in this deal. Yeah, I mean, what a, what a terrible detail, right? You'd, you'd prefer to just get the cash. But the, then, then they literally find bars with serial numbers on them, Lawrence. Mm -hmm. So you know they're the same ones that originated uh, there in his closet. It's very, very tough evidence. This Nothing is worse than that. You can see the numbers there. They can trace mm -hmm. them back. He's really hurting. And as you say, his wife is quite involved in this as well. And there's a whole kind of long past for her that may well come in at trial. Harry Lippman, thank you very much for joining us Thanks. tonight.